I've never done a video on how to handle a major pest infestation for the simple reason that we never have them, even though we do almost nothing to control pests in our garden. Now it's hard to say how much of this can be attributed to our pest management strategies versus where we live and the types of pests we have here. But I thought I'd share with you the basics of our do-nothing philosophy of pest control and hope that it might help some of you avoid major infestations in the future. Today I'll focus on insects, slugs, and the like. The first principle we follow is to create an environment that supports a broad diversity of life. We want our soil to be healthy and teeming with microbes, earthworms, and other beneficial soil organisms. We grow plants and flowers that attract pollinators and other beneficial insects, including those that prey on pests. And we do our best to create an environment that is safe for birds, four-legged creatures, and of course humans. To this end, we avoid using all synthetic fertilizers and pesticides as well as organic pesticides, which could potentially damage beneficial organisms. The next principle is that healthy soil leads to healthy, pest-resistant plants. Years ago, I heard Elliot Coleman talk about how he saw many cabbage moths on his farm, but very little damage from cabbage worms. He attributed this to the health of the soil and the plants. At the time, I was skeptical, but we've had the same exact experience in our garden. There are cabbage moths everywhere, but the damage from cabbage worms isn't bad at all. Healthy pest resistant plants start with healthy soil and the life of the soil is key to that health. To promote the soil food web and ensure sufficient nutrients, we follow a very simple strategy of amending the soil with homemade compost, worm castings, and mulch from free local resources. We also grow nitrogen fixing cover crops in the fall. A soil test this spring confirmed that this approach supplies more than enough nutrients for our plants and that no additional fertilizers or amendments are needed. In fact, the test even showed that we could cut back on our compost applications. The next principle is to grow in polycultures. In this small 4x4 foot bed, we're growing beets, squash, corn, pole beans, and scarlet runner beans. This cacophony of scents and sights makes it difficult for pests to find their desired food source, which results in less pest damage. The only damage I could find in this bed was to some of the older beet leaves. The next principle is to allow predators to control pests. For example, we rarely see aphids in the garden, but when we do, they've usually fallen victim to a predator. Let's take a look in this bed to see this principle in action. Here you can see aphids trapped in a spider's web above the leaf mulch which by the way is an excellent habitat for spiders. When I look at the plant above the spider's web, I don't find any aphids. In addition to spiders, we often see other predators like ladybugs and lacewings, and on occasion praying mantises and dragonflies, which prey on cabbage moths and other pests. All in all, predators do a great job of controlling most pests in our garden. Needless to say, pesticides could disrupt this delicate balance. Even relatively safe controls like neem can coat insects and kill beneficial insects, like bees, lacewings, and ladybugs. Unfortunately, especially in heavy populated urban areas, there isn't always a predator for every pest. And that's when we resort to manual control and other minimally invasive interventions. Unfortunately, there aren't enough squash bug predators here to keep them under control, so we have to step in and play the role of predator ourselves. All we do is look for the eggs in the bottom of squash leaves and remove them with packing tape. This works great to keep them in check. We also manually remove adult squash bugs. The same is true for slugs. Of course, ducks are great slug predators, but we can't keep them in our yard. So instead, we sometimes resort to homemade slug traps, which work great. Fortunately, despite all the rain we've had lately and the nearly ideal conditions for slugs, they haven't been much of a problem this year, and we haven't had to set out any traps. In addition to squash bugs and slugs, we also manually remove pests like Japanese beetles and cabbage moths when we happen to see them. Here I'm removing a cabbage moth cocoon from a kale leaf. Finally, when playing the role of predator, we always make sure to ID unknown insects before intervening. Our default position is to assume that all insects are beneficial, unless we know otherwise. The final principle is to tolerate imperfection. We'd rather have holes in our tree collars than wage an all-out war on pests, kill beneficials in the process, and disrupt nature's delicate balance. Besides, slightly stressed plants are more nutritious. 
Plants produce increased levels of antioxidants as a defense against environmental stressors like pest damage. So when you see holes in your greens, just remember those holes mean more antioxidants in your diet. So those are our do-nothing pest control principles. There may be situations when more intervention is required, but I believe the starting point should be a minimally invasive approach that works with nature. I think you'll get better results in the long run. Well, that's all for now. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, remember, you can change the world one yard at a time.